to each. Generally, stained glass represents a visualization of the beliefs of the congregation. Visualizing belief is sometimes difficult, overcome by the telling of common stories or by the representation of belief through symbol. For an illiterate congregation, stained glass was a catechism. It was designed by the clergy to portray the principles necessary for saving one's soul. It was a kind of talking book. The clergy determined the plan of the windows with this objective in mind. And we're talking clergy, Catholic Church, Middle Ages. There is a significant correlation between the illustrations in medieval manuscripts and the imagery in stained glass which is to say the clergy was doing both. The Reformation broke with traditions of the Catholic Church, individual faith became primary. The sway of sacraments and doctrine was broken. The ornament of saints and symbols was distasteful to new religious groups. Churches became places of meetings for worship, singing, preaching, and ornament was at a minimum at a minimum and stained glass virtually died out for two to three hundred years because of that. The neo-gothic revolution in England and France brought renewed interest in medieval crafts reinterpreted to the reformed theologies. Clergy still led the way in determining content but congregations and committees played a stronger role. This would describe the status in many churches today. In this talk, we will review each window, determine its story and its message, and in summary, look at future possibilities. So, uh, Christian heritage of Im image and symbol are relevant to our stained glass, and there is a growing Unitarian tradition that we will look at as well. Stained glass is architectural ornament. That is, Sorry. it is not simply a picture in colored glass. It takes its style from the style of the architecture, and it takes its content in part from the symbolism of its location in the church. The first churches were an adaptation of an existing Roman building form and probably a reuse of the buildings themselves this form was called a basilica. I have a pointer. So, there was a large space for congregating. There was a central aisle for procession. There was a raised dais for the governor or presider to conduct the uh, meeting. Um, under Christian influence, the space was elaborated in various ways, adding a forward transept, a rear transept, an extended apse. And in fact, when we look at this, this is kind of the plan of our church. Christians from very early times had leaded and painted stained glass. Little survives. These scraps are from the ninth century and from the town that Dolores Hill grew up in, Lorsch, Germany. Um, but we know from the written record that even earlier the Church of St. Martin's of Tours in France was glazed in colored glass in the years between 500 and 675. This was stained glass as we know it today. That is, the color is in the glass. It is not applied. Paint is applied to define, um, to delineate, and to tone. Here we see a, a sort of a, a, a face in it, probably Jesus or a saint. The paint was fired on, paint was black, and it was fired on to become as permanent as the glass. The color in the glass, this blue is the same blue 
as the glass that came out of the kiln. This color does not fade. And the pieces were leaded with a leading very much like what we use today. A convention in stained glass worth noting before beginning our individual analyses is that the placement of windows within the building had significance. Churches were generally set on an east to west access. I believe we are as well. The altar was in the east, the direction of the rising sun, the place of hope, sacrament, and preaching. The entry exit doors faced west, the place of the setting sun, the place of death, judgment, and exit to worldly life. The transept and side chapels near the altar were devoted to figures of significance, like the saint for whom the church was named, or a chapel to the Virgin Mary. At USG, this customary placement is evident in the living Christ at the altar, as Jesus the Good Shepherd, and the triptych to Mary in the left transept. We do have a window among our windows here that we'll talk about later of Christ in judgment that in another building might have been over the exit doors. I'm showing the motherhood window from our church um, just to point out some features that we will uh, look at throughout the windows. Uh, windows have a theme generally established with a main uh, scene or figure, and here it is mother and child. That theme has sometimes complementary scenes or imagery. Here these would be considered complementary. In this instance, they are vaguely related to this one, um, but generally it's a tighter uh, relationship. Um, this might also be considered a subsidiary theme, and there is a place for, for text, or in this instance, the donor's name. Windows have borders, as do ours. They have background pieces. And um, borders and background may or may not contribute substantially to the content of the window or to the artistry of the window. In our instance, Niccolo Descenzo, who really represents a high end of the stained glass art, <laughs> threw his heart into the borders and the background. We've got some of the best borders and backgrounds I've ever seen anywhere. And when we begin our discussion, we're going to start with the front window so that you can see how the backgrounds are ornamented. Okay. So Unitarianism has a tradition in stained glass as well. Um, and for some perspective on that, here is a quick timeline of Unitarianism because the uh, stylistic changes in the windows have followed this timeline to some extent. So we have a foundation period which was late 1800s to early 19th century here uh, in England and here. Um, you could break it up with Priestley uh, in the mid-Atlantic area and New England 1825. The Dedham decision about the division of churches kind of is a marker. Transcendentalists, given the period 1835 to 1865, um, the rise of that movement included many Unitarian figures like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Theodore Parker, William Ellery Channing. The national borders were expanding, and the Unitarians fashioned a national outreach. Um, it was, in fact, Horace Greeley, a Unitarian, who said, go west, young man. Um, even though this movement is characterized as beginning in 1865, and we were founded in 1865, I can't, you, we probably weren't part of that, that 
particular outreach. 20th century sees the growth of humanism, um, a new phenomenon in the Unitarian movement, with our own William Sullivan as a national speaker on the deist side of the argument. Unitarians and Universalists joined in 1961, Universalists bringing a more richly Christian background. And our statement of sources, as well as um, the practice within UU congregations, uh, includes world religions and earth-centered traditions. That came along in the 70s. So, I've divided the Unitarian uh, stained glass into the inherited stock, Christian biblical themes, um, and part of the common parlance, many Unitarians consider themselves Christian, and still do. Idealizations, which was popular in the Victorian uh, period, um, so here, here is a, an image of some Christian themed windows. You've got the archangels on the left. This is at a Unitarian church in Massachusetts. This is St. Paul and his voyages and writings at Restoration Church, Stenton and Gorgas Lane. The ide idealizations we will talk about when we come to these windows. They're very much within that tradition, as well as uh, being represented at First Church in Philadelphia. The humanist tradition in stained glass can be seen in the tribute to individuals and their deeds. Here is a farmer and Revolutionary War hero and his wife in New England. Um, and in our own church, uh, the Meehan window might be in this tradition. Thomas Meehan founded a prominent landscape firm that contributed to Philadelphia's treescape. The window reads, plants diverse and strange. Uh, Meehan was very conversant in the import of new species. Um, besides his Germantown nursery, he was a founder of the Philadelphia Botanical Club a Philadelphia city councilman, a developer of city parks, the rediscoverer of the pink dogwood, and a correspondent with Charles Darwin and Asa Gray and other 19th century scientists. He also saved the Martin's Garden. Yes. I'm sorry? He saved Martin's Garden. He Did he really? He made it part of the uh, Fairmont Park system. He was a member here? Yes. Um, well, someone in the Meehan family was. Whether it was Thomas W., I don't know. Thomas W. founded the nursery in Germantown. Real estate people, because as the development was coming up here, I have, I have a postcard of a real estate office, Meehan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Frank Lloyd Wright was of a Unitarian family. He's sometimes characterized as Unitarian, but he never signed anybody's membership book. Um, he reconceived the worship experience with his Unity Temple, unlike any other church to be found. <laughs> and my sources tell me that it was based on Middle Eastern temples, Assyrian temples. And he reconceived stained glass. He anticipated the German geometric architectonic stained glass style that grew out of the Bauhaus. And he called these light screens. <coughs> There's no doctrine here, just architectural ornament. Unitarian churches have combined very modern stained glass in very traditional buildings. This building in Louisville, Kentucky had a fire. They took the opportunity of reconstructing after the fire, fire to reconceive their stained glass. 
And the humanist mode is still in effect. This window from Las Cruces, New Mexico, celebrates member Clyde Tumbaugh, <coughs> discoverer of Pluto, whatever it's called now, planet, <laughs> dust ball, I'm not sure, and his scientific accomplishments. So we move on to a discussion of our windows. Um, everyone should have a flyer uh, which was put together uh, years ago by Glo Delamar and a committee. But first a, a word about the principal window designer, Niccolo Descenso. Um, not every religious building can have their windows designed by a noted stained glass artist, and he was the top of the heap at the time, and a stained glass artist who is also a member. Descenso uh, came from Italy. He studied at a number of places. This was where he ended up, museum school, but he studied in New York City, and he studied at the Academy of Fine Arts. When he arrived here, he took decorative ornament, being taught by Myrtle Goodwin. He married her <laughs> and then began to teach. Um, he began his stained glass career, as did William Willett and others of the era. It was considered a decorative art like murals or other internal ornament. But he soon focused on stained glass. The quality of his work can be seen by these prestigious commissions that he executed. And I'll be speaking to individual details as we go around. Um, he did eight windows in our uh, sanctuary here, most of them done for the um, initial uh, opening of the church, but one did come along in 1940. <coughs> Details are on your um, pamphlet. And the style that he established is a very finely rendered Renaissance style and very appropriate to the building architecture and ornament. Okay. This uh, diagram illustrates um, the windows in the sanctuary and notes which have, are religious in theme. I have defined religious according to the following terms. Biblical in foundation denotes sanctity of figures with halos and or includes symbols of standard Christian doctrine. Nine windows meet at least one of these criteria. And Sullivan Chapel adds, makes the count to, to 10. We're going to start with a window that we can't see. Uh, this is the sewer window. Um, I apologize for the quality of the image. I took it at night from across the street. Um, without a very powerful camera, I guess. Um, but it's the best I had available. Um, it is illuminated at night and shines onto Lincoln Drive. It was made by the same firm that made these windows, but later, made in 1930. It honors Frederick Taylor, the founder of scientific management. And if you want to know more, Tom Schoonmaker is here. <laughs> Um, I didn't want to try to describe scientific management. I would refer them to you, Tom. The sower is a parable from the Bible in which the seeds represent the word of God. Okay, now we're going to do, we're going to go walk about. Um, please join me at the front of the church.
you see? I want you to um, be able to see the fine uh, line work on the backgrounds here. Um, this is uh, the theme of the window is um, Jesus the Good Shepherd. These are pretty standard features of Renaissance style ornament as are these figures on the side and these figures on the side. There are four subsidiary themes here. This is charity. This is, I can't read them. Faith. Faith. Uh, it, this is prayer, and I believe that's hope. Um, we also have the scales of judgment, and we have the tablets of the law. Um, <laughs> this is so beautiful. You see, the, the triangular, sh the um, diamond shapes are a standard feature for backgrounds in stained glass windows. In fact, they have a name. They're called quarries. And will see homes and things that have diamond shapes like this fastened together. So um, he bumped that up a notch. First of all, he toned the entire window with stained glass paint by putting washes of paint on there, um, which was fired on. That's very important because when you have an east-facing window and your services happen in the morning, you can get blasted out of there by the sun. So his t toning was in consideration of the kind of light you might have coming through here, which we don't because of the trees. Um, note that he has put little pieces of colored glass in between the quarries and the little central pieces, very elaborate. And he has a series of symbols here that you will see in his other windows. So you have the crown, which recommends, which um, represents uh, Christ, uh, crowned king upon his ascendance into heaven. You have the book of the, um, the Bible. You have, this is probably a helibor, um, the Christmas rose. You have the light of knowledge the lamp of knowledge, you have lilies representing purity or the virgin. Um, let's see, others, uh, you have a bird in flight with a branch in its mouth, which could be uh, the bird returning to uh, the ark. Um, see that he has repeated these throughout this window, but also in the other windows. And created a very dense fabric of imagery and meaning. The next thing I want to talk about is this lovely surround mosaic. This was done by Dicenzo's son, Niccolo Jr., uh, who I suppose had ideas of going into the family business because he worked with his father for a while and he became proficient in the mosaic technique which had been closely held in Italy. There's statements that this is the first window to repeat Italian techniques, especially the gold-backed tesserae. Um, we talked about that the windows are visualizations of the beliefs of a community. Take a look at this angel here. This is the apex of the congregation's focus. Anybody like to guess what this symbol is? Stands for? It stands for the Trinity. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? People educated in Unitarianism puts the Trinity in that position. But we will see symbols of Trinity repeated around our windows. And I don't believe this is casual. I mean, I think it was mistaken. But um, 
Duchenzo ran the kind of studio where his people understood the symbols. They didn't just repeat them. So I don't know what was going in, going on. I looked up Forbes, who was the minister here before Sullivan. I would have been the minister when the money raising was going on and the committees were being formed. He was an excellent speaker in demand around the country, part of the expansion movement. No indication that he was a reactionary, uh, a religious reactionary. So it's a mystery. It's not <laughs> what the designer decided, just Deshenzo's son decided that it's a church, it should have that in it. Your designs are approved by the congregation or the minister. Oh, yes. They maybe didn't even understand. Well, and maybe they didn't understand. Yeah, I, yeah. Maybe they missed it. Susan, the um, Curtis was a member of the church. In the Curtis Center, they're stained glass. Is that Dischenzo or is there any relation between I believe them? that's Tiffany. Tiffany. Mm -hmm. No, 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 not the, not the mosaic. They're stained glass, like in the office. I don't know. I mean, they're small windows, like uh, right we have. I'd love to see them. Colorful. Okay. Yes. Gold leaf on those? Gold leaf, it is um, clear glass with gold leaf on the back so that once mounted into plaster, that it reflects the light coming at it, but that is not subject to being scratched over time or anything. It's protected. How long do you think it took to the window? How long did it take? I don't know. It depends how many people he had working on it. There was a lot installed here in 1928. A lot. There were many windows installed. Did they come from the other church? No. Some did. Well, yes, these, but there are a lot of new Dicenzo windows characterized as installed in 1928. The motherhood window was installed in 1928 that we're going to talk about soon. It seems like I've seen a picture where this hadn't been installed. Was this installed afterward, or was I imagining that? Yes, this came, the surround came uh, several years later. And the window? No, uh, I, I think, let's see what our pamphlet says. OK. This window, um, this is left 101, I think. This window is, was given by Curtis. There is a liar in the medallion at the top. That would have been a, a symbol of music, but this was the site of both choir and organ at the time. So that would have been appropriate. You will see some of the symbols that we found in this window here repeated in the background. So you've got the scales of judgment, you've got the open book, you've got some floral arrangements, but others of these are, Glow Delamar and her committee says, printer's marks, and placed there in tribute to Curtis. In this window? Yes. So this would be a printer's mark, uh, below the, the crossbar, uh, upper left panel, mm -hmm. middle panel left corner would be a, a printer's mark. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they stand for. I didn't research that. Okay, next we're going to go to the motherhood window. Yes. The tree could mean a lot of things, right? Like, <coughs> uh uh. <laughs> not portrayed. Not portrayed as a triangle. It's it's uh, pretty much Trinity. Okay. This is called the motherhood window, but this isn't just any mother. <laughs> not just any. <laughs> no. Both of the figures have halos as does the Jesus figure. 
And I have to say, halos are optional. <laughs> I, <laughs> I did windows for Methodist churches, uh, for um, uh, Protestant churches in which nobody had a halo, or maybe just Jesus had a halo. <laughs> but halos are not mandatory. <laughs> so we have the virgin and child, have a lovely star at the top. This book and lily, uh, I don't know of a specific meaning, but lilies mean either the virgin or purity. The book is knowledge or, and or the word, the Bible. This is the cross and crown generally means Christ's victory over death. So these are not exactly contributing to motherhood. Um, these symbols may have something to do with the Beck family. I looked up Beck. I don't know who this family is, but Beck engraving was doing mezzotints in Philadelphia at the turn of the century, had a very large enterprise. It could have been that Beck. Um, OK. Now we're going to do the clear stories down the central aisle, unless there's any questions. You see that Dicenzo is again filling the backgrounds. Um, first of all, he is shading the glass so that um, the um, light diffuses over the glass. Uh, and he's filled it with these lovely symbols. And look at this border. It's so colorful. And if, this is a tradition in which change of color indicates change of glass, because the color is in the glass. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing lots of little pieces in the border. That's fine work. Look at the treatment of the robe on Mary. Beautiful brocade. Um, beautiful features. I think the, the blues and reds that are used in the borders of a number of the windows are just, you know, like eye popping. Mm. Just <laughs> leaps out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Susan? Yes. Um, when you're a new member here, frequently you're told that the, the Unitarian Church is from the Judeo Christian background. That might be a symbol of the Trinity, but it looks to me, and I could be wrong, as if there's a superimposed other triangle behind it, yeah. which yes. is Logan David. And so that, that would be Judeo-Christian, wouldn't it? Well, it could be. I mean, it could, could make it look more like it could be a... The back, there, there is a triangle that is superimposed on three circles that are joined. The circles that are joined would be the entities of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But the triangle work 